Okay, let's dive in. We're tackling something, you know, pretty ambitious today. Something really buzzing in theoretical neuroscience. What if the deepest secrets of, you know, consciousness, learning, mastering a skill, what if it wasn't really about biology or uh, chemistry deep down? What if it was purely geometric? And we're not just talking metaphor here. This is about a specific proposal. They call it the Cognitive Metric Tensor Framework. It tries to bridge high-level geometry, actual brain activity we can measure, and maybe even quantum stuff to create what the sources are calling an executable blueprint for the mind. And kind of central to all this is this idea of a coding language, the Geometric Configuration Language, GCL. Apparently, there's even a prototype. The people behind this, they're making some huge claims, like seven major breakthroughs, solving consciousness, building conscious AI. The works. So our job today, our mission is really crucial. We need to give you the tools to understand why this is getting attention. That means, you know, separating the solid science, what we know happens in labs, from the really big, maybe still hypothetical leaps this whole system is taking. Yeah, and it's super important to ground this first. Because the foundation, it's actually built on accepted neuroscience. The bedrock fact is neural manifolds. They're real. Think about your brain state right now, maybe remembering something or planning a movement. We already model that complex activity. We model it as a point moving around in a kind of abstract, high-dimensional space, often a curved space. Those are neural manifolds. We measure them. We look at the distances, the paths, the trajectories between different thoughts or states. Okay, so if I'm learning, say, a new language phrase, mm. my brain state moves from a don't-know-it point to a know-it point of this this mind space, mm -hmm. we're literally mapping thought territory. Exactly. We observe that geometry. But the cognitive metric tensor, the CMT, that's the hypothesis about what causes the geometry. It proposes a mechanism. The core equation they put forward is delta plus lambda HL. Let's break that down a bit. Zeta is the metric tensor. Basically, in math, that defines the shape of a space, its curvature, how you measure distances in it. So JO is like a snapshot of the shape of your mental landscape at any given moment. And the other side of the equal sign that tells us what creates that shape. Precisely. Delta is like your baseline geometry. Maybe think flat, standard space. Your brain's structure before specific, impactful experiences pile up. But the really key part, the big theoretical step, is idemery. They call this the experience tensor. Ah, okay. So idemery is where the experience comes in. It's meant to be a number or a set of numbers that represents learning. And that's what actually warps the space? That's the core idea, yes. The hypothesis is that learning, memory, experience, it physically changes the curvature of this neural manifold. The lambda, lambda, that's just a constant saying how strongly experienced Edemary turns into curvature. This takes it from just describing geometry we see to saying, okay, this is what causes the geometry to change and we think we can calculate it. It becomes predictive. Okay, but hang on. If it's predictive, it has to account for, well, everything, not just learning skills. What about negative experiences like trauma? Does the theory say anything about how something like chronic stress might warp this space? Does it create, I don't know, like a black hole in your mind map? That's actually a strength that they claim. The math behind EIG allows for different kinds of curvature, including negative curvature. So trauma, for example, might be modeled as a really strong negative EIA value in a specific region. This could create a severe local warp, maybe trapping thoughts or emotional states in these damaging repetitive loops. A measurable geometric problem. <laughs> that sounds <Yeah>. neat. <laughs> Almost too neat. But if you can compute this EI tensor, this experience value, then yeah, the logical next step is building a tool to compute it, to run the model. Which brings us to that GCL thing, the geometric configuration language. This sounds like where the theory meets like practical coding. The sources are clear. It's not sci-fi. It's meant as a DSL, a domain-specific language. Kind of like Python, but just for neuroscientists working with these geometric ideas, a standard toolkit. Exactly that. It aims to standardize how researchers model this stuff. Instead of everyone writing their own custom code, which makes things hard to compare, GCO would offer a common language, a clear syntax to define the geometry for different cognitive tasks based on the CMT framework. Makes testing the theory much easier. And it directly translates goals, like learning, into geometry problems. So back to my language phrase example. You define a start state in GCL me not knowing the phrase and an end state me knowing it. And the goal, the program's goal is Literally, optimization goal. Mm -hmm. Minimize geodesic length. Yes, and that word geodesic is critical here. We need to pause on that. On a curved surface, like these proposed neural manifolds, a geodesic isn't just any old line between two points. It's the shortest possible path, the most efficient route, considering the curvature. Wow. 
Okay, so the theory is saying that the best way to learn, the fastest, most efficient way to get from novice to expert, is literally to find and follow the shortest geometric path through this mental space that's been warped by the experienced tensor. Minimize the travel distance. That's precisely the idea. Minimum effort, minimum time, defined geometrically. And a key claim is that GCL isn't just a plan. They say there's a working prototype. Apparently, it's already computing things like curvature, determinants, geodesics. You know, the math needed to make the model work. It bridges the theory and actual simulation. But let me push back a bit here. If GCL is partly about standardizing existing methods for modeling neural geometry, is the big news the language itself or just the underlying CMT theory it's built to execute? Is it just fancy software for old stats or is it doing something fundamentally new? That's the debate, isn't it? Critics might say, yeah, it's just a new way to wrap existing statistical techniques for analyzing neural data. But the proponents argue DCL is more than just syntax. It's the first language specifically designed to manipulate that EIG tensor, calculate geodesic paths based on it, and potentially model the phase transitions we're about to get into. It's meant to execute the specific physics of the CMT model. And that connection between the abstract geometry and something we can maybe measure in the brain, that leads to probably the most specific and maybe surprising detail in the sources, this idea of the brain's master clock. The framework links the geometric warping to a very, very precise frequency, 0 0.0159 hertz. 0 0.0159 hertz. It's incredibly specific. That's what about one cycle every minute, a little over a minute, 63 seconds, in a brain firing away in milliseconds. Why would this super slow rhythm be the, uh, the master coordinator? Well, that frequency fits squarely into what are called infraslow oscillations, or ISOs. These are huge slow waves you can pick up with fMRI, sometimes EEG. We already have evidence that these ISOs help coordinate activity across large parts of the brain. They seem to modulate the faster brain waves. So in this geometric framework, 0 0.0159 hertz is proposed as the integration frequency. It's supposedly the natural time scale over which the brain's overall geometry settles down. After learning something new, injects the ENI's experience value and warps the space. This frequency governs how the whole manifold relaxes into its new stable configuration. It's the tempo of geometric change. So learning is an instant. Geometrically speaking, the brain needs like a minute to fully update its map, and this slow rhythm paces that update. That's the idea. And it connects directly to their theory of consciousness itself. The framework doesn't just describe learning. It models consciousness as a geometric phase transition. Think water turning to ice, a fundamental change in state. They propose this happens when a mathematical value, a consciousness order parameter, crosses a specific critical threshold. And here comes the second really specific number they give. That threshold, TTC Edwiz, is defined as 0 0.618. Wait. 0.618. That's the golden ratio, isn't it? That feels <laughs> almost mystical. Is that intentional? Oh, it's definitely intentional. It connects to ideas about how complex systems, especially those in nature with fractal-like properties, often find stability or critical points related to this ratio. And in physics, when a system gets very close to a critical point like this, a phase transition point, it often shows something called critical slowing down. Things fluctuate more slowly, become more sensitive. So the hypothesis is the dominance of that ultra-slow 0.01 five nine hertz rhythm that could be the brain's signature of operating near this critical phase transition point it's the system exhibiting critical slowing down poised between states highly responsive searching for that stable geometric configuration and this isn't just hand waving it makes a testable prediction if this is right the measured power of those isos should directly correlate with the measured curvature of the neural manifolds more curvature stronger 0 0.0159 hertz signal okay that specificity does make it feel more like testable science, less like pure philosophy, mm. which I guess brings us to the really big picture stuff. The proponents are claiming this whole framework because it's self-consistent and supposedly executable via GCL achieves what they call it, seven geometric breakthroughs. These are massive claims, so we need to look at them closely with a healthy dose of skepticism. Absolutely. Right? Let's tick through them. Number one, maybe the biggest claim of all, they say they've solved the hard problem of consciousness. Whoa, hold on. Solved it, not just, you know, offered a new angle. That's right. that's probably the single boldest claim possible in neuroscience or philosophy of mind. How did they justify saying solved beyond just stating the math works out? Their argument is that it's not emergence in the usual slightly vague sense. They claim it's a mathematical proof. They define qualia subjective experience, redness, the feeling of pain as a necessary mathematical property that must arise when the brain's geometry hits that specific critical phase transition point, TCA adults 0.61818 adults. 
It's like saying, if the geometry has these exact properties, subjective experience isn't optional. It's a required feature of that geometric state. Hmm. Okay. That directly feeds into their second claim then. The binding problem is solved. How all the separate bits of information, sights, sounds, feelings merge into one unified experience. Right. And that's where the master clock frequency comes back in. The 0 0.0159 hertz rhythm is proposed as the synchronizing signal. It acts like a temporal backbone, ensuring that all the different processing areas, the different manifolds for vision, hearing, etc., align their geometric reshaping process at the same rate. This coherence, they argue, creates the unified field of consciousness. Okay, third breakthrough. Neural code decryption is achieved through GCL. The idea being, if you can describe any thought or cognitive process using this geometric language, then you've essentially cracked the code. You can program thought. That's the implication. And it leads straight to number four, the engineering claim. AI consciousness is engineerable. They're basically saying, we have the math, we have the blueprint. They think they know the specific geometric curvature and the internal clock frequency a machine would need to hit that TC.618 A8 threshold and, well, wake up. Wow, okay. Fifth, then, is a revolution in clinical psychiatry. So instead of thinking about chemical imbalances, maybe, conditions like schizophrenia or coma would be seen as specific geometric problems, okay. malformed mind maps. Exactly. Schizophrenia could be perhaps fragmented manifolds that fail to synchronize at that 0 0.0159 hertz frequency. Severe depression might be like being stuck in a deep pit of negative curvature in the manifold. Specific diagnosable geometric pathologies. Which I suppose offers a path to treatment, if you can diagnose the geometric fault. That's the hope. Maybe you could calculate the precise push needed, perhaps using targeted brain stimulation or neurofeedback guided by GCL to nudge the system's geometry back towards a healthier state, a more functional trajectory. Okay, number six is maybe the one most relevant to, well, anyone listening. Learning optimization is solved because learning is geodesic minimization. Finding the shortest path they claim you can calculate the absolute fastest way to learn anything. Theoretically, yes. If you can map the starting novice state and the target expert state in the manifold, and you understand the curvature created by EAJ, you could compute the geodesic, the optimal learning path. Dramatically accelerated skill acquisition, potentially. And the final one, number seven. A unified physics of mind is established. This is the grand synthesis, right? Linking tiny quantum effects, maybe in microtubules like others have proposed, directly up to the large-scale geometry of neural networks and tying that geometry to conscious experience. Precisely. It aims to connect the fundamental laws of physics to the emergent properties of mind through this continuous chain of geometric description. Okay. That is quite a list. Seven massive claims. But you can see how they fit together, how it forms a complete, if incredibly ambitious, theoretical package. So, stepping back. What's the big takeaway here? The core philosophical shift this framework proposes is. Yeah. It's pretty fundamental. It really is. It flips the whole question. Instead of how does biology, this physical stuff, create subjective mind, it asks how does the geometry of the system, its shape and curvature and state space constitute experience? Consciousness isn't something the brain produces. It's a state the brain's geometry is. And the appeal, I think, is how it tries to weave everything together. The math, the potential quantum links, the measurable brain activity like manifolds and those slow ISOs, the 0 0.0159 hertz clock, mm -hmm. and packages it into something that claims to be testable, executable via GCL. It moves the conversation into computational science, away from just arm-waving philosophy. And even if only parts of it hold up, particularly the ideas around ELA and geodesic minimization for learning, the practical implications could still be huge. Right. Which leads us nicely into a final thought for you, the listener, to mull over. If this framework, or even just the core geometric idea, is on the right track, if every time you learn something, have a significant thought, or form a memory, you are literally physically warping the geometry of your own mental space. What does that really mean for who you are? Is your identity just the cumulative shape of your manifold? And maybe more practically, if learning really is about finding the shortest path, the geodesic, how efficient are you really being when you try to master something new? Could you actually calculate or at least strive for that minimal path next time you set out to learn? What would that look like? 